Marquez. He's playing Merfolk. The Fishies, and he has four copies of True Name. There you go. Now, for, you know, the thing about Merfolk that is kind of weird is, like, because True Name Nemesis is Merfolk, you think this is where you'd want to put True Name, but I actually think this is one of the poorer places to put True Name Nemesis. Yeah, uh, Ben Lundquist uh, noted Merfolk aficionado uh, likes True Name Nemesis, Nemesis in the sideboard, but game one just wants as many lords as possible. See Robert with a turn one curse catcher. Um, Patrick, I don't know if you've uh, ever had to delete a tweet before, but uh, a few minutes ago, uh, as you see a curse catcher here and Brad going to uh, start cantripping, I had made a tweet about the, uh, the Cleveland football team destroying the Patriots. Uh, the Patriots somehow have the ball again and are driving with a minute left. So if I go, uh, if I go missing or just delete my Twitter account, I, I don't know why that would be moving forward. All of my deleted tweets involve poor grammar or syntax or spelling mistakes. If I have to put my foot in my mouth for this, I am <laughs> going to be quite upset, especially after the Vegas blunder earlier this morning. As Curse Catcher coming into the red zone, Brad, a little, uh, a little brainstorm on the end step, which is pretty telling because that means that I, I have a feeling he's going to be going for a going for some theatrics next turn. Or potentially he's missing a mana source and wants to be spending three mana on something next turn. And it does appear as though he is short on mana. Well, no, that's not true. He can actually cast a sneak attack through his pedal and his third, his third land, but that exposes him to things like daze as well. So we still might want to sit and try to develop a better hand before going for it. As you see Brad here debating what he wants to put back with this brainstorm. And you see the show and tell he's got a lotus petal. I mean, whenever this deck has an end of turn brainstorm, that means that they're probably going for something here. And he doesn't even sack the fetch line yet, so he is a. Uh, I've got a feeling that Brad is moving in here. Maybe, no. maybe not, okay. I think Brad wants to keep uh, all the cards that he's seen so far. He just doesn't have enough resources to fight through any resistance that, that Robert could realistically have. You see Rob with a handful of lords he's not willing to cast. Yeah, he's not making any move. Is that a swan song in his hand? Checking the main deck, he has one. Yeah. Just one, wow. And he's got one of my favorite cards, actually, in the Merfolk deck. He has three standstills in his deck, which I, uh, which I absolutely adore. I love that card in this deck. Yeah, I do, I too. I always have. I don't, Benny, Benny, he kind of comes and goes on swan song. On Swan Song. Or sorry, Standstill? No, he, he's generally very pro. There's been a couple of meta games where he hasn't liked it, but a, as a rule, he's pretty pro. It just leads to more busted draws. You know, you really only have Aether Vial in this deck that provides you with just a, an incredibly powerful draw across the board. Standstill is another piece of that. You can play it on most empty boards because of, of Muta Vault in your own deck, and it's very easy for this deck to get a slight edge in the early game where landing a standstill represents an enormous edge. <sighs> Brainstorm on the end of turn. You know, we're in his, we're in his main. Oh, my apologies, my apologies. Looking at a, uh, you know, Brad's got a pretty powerful hand here, a reasonable amount of mana, a couple of forcibles to fight over things. Uh, the thing is that Robert's not really putting under him under very much pressure. So he may not want to rush it just yet because uh, Robert's getting uh, enough time to set up potentially a better hand that can fight through even more resistance. I mean, with Brad, Brad, I mean, Brad's not underneath any pressure right now right. at all. I'm kind of interested to see how what, what Sneak and Show looks like moving forward. Like, not in the not with the composition of the deck because it's not really going to change but you know, again, we saw what happened at the Invitational where, you know, Huey in the in the finals, Brad winning with it, um, Jerry top eighting, Brian Braun to win, like all of the big name players playing Sneak and Show. Mm -hmm. And then everyone preparing for it at DC. You know, what what happens moving forward to a deck like this where you know, and, and to be fair again, Jared Betcher got second place with the deck and then won the week after the Legacy Open with the deck. So, I mean, is this deck just still gonna just be huge? Yeah. Even though it didn't have a, you know, 
the the Grand Prix performance that everyone was expecting it to have? Um, or does it kind of decline a little bit here because people are just so prepared for it now? Well, uh, it's I, I don't actually think the field is sufficiently prepared across the board. I think some of the matchups have gone a lot harder, and certainly the prevalence of Medley Mage showing up in these decks makes things wor worse for Sting and Show, but I don't think this deck's going anywhere, quite honestly. It's very powerful and consistent and pretty stable as far as a uh, multicolor combo deck can be in this format. You see a Wasteland on the Agent Tomb there, and Robert deciding to fire up that, that Muta Vault and getting across for three. And yeah, shields, are, shields are down a little bit now. Again, we know that Robert, uh, or we suspect Robert has Swan Song in his hand. One thing about, uh, and I actually, ooh, Misdirection is actually a pretty good draw there for Brad. One thing I actually like about this uh, with Brad is, uh, or excuse me, from Robert's side, is that the Swan Song in his hand and in his deck is something that there's like no way Brad's going to play around that. Right. You know, it just has a nice one of, which I can see that card actually be a pretty good one of. As here comes the Lord, probably? Yep. A master of the Pearl Trident. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think uh, I don't think Brad has much of a reason to counter that or fight over that. And to be fair, I don't think Robert would actually Robert would just let him counter it if he cared. City of Traders have a really good draw here. Robert has so many cards in his hand that it's hard to fight over that. Mm -hmm. And now with the pedal in his hand, he has two sources of red he potentially has two red sources of mana this turn, which highly incentivizes him to, to go for a sneak attack. So this is the this is the uh, this is the big turn, as they say. Swan Song gonna target the sneak attack. Nelson, does he want to spell pierce or does he want to force a will? Because if he force a wills, he can pay for days. And the curse catcher. Yeah, the the risk here is that if the uh, spell pierce gets curse catchered, then you have to. Presumably, sack your pedal to pay, and then Brad can't do anything with his with his sneak attack this mm -hmm. turn. That is the big issue, and I think Curse Catcher is going to say, "Hey, yeah, do that. Pay one more for that spell pierce." And Brad says, "All right, I'll use my Lotus Pedal to do that." So now Swan Song gets countered. This is in, and now <laughs> Robert, you have to kill him. Well, he might be able to get enough permanence into play to be able to survive an Evercold trigger. That's true. That's true. He's already got four in play. He's got more lords in hand. He's got yeah. He's got four lords. He's he's got four lords. A master. Now, if it's Crystal Brand, it's a it's a different story. But yeah, I'm with you. He might have it. He might be able to get enough from us in play. Because he's got a wasteland in his hand. He's got another master. I think he might have a true name nemesis too. Yeah, the, this could I, get mighty interesting. I think the problem is he might not have enough blue mana to make two plays yeah. this turn. Yep. You can see Robert looks like he's counting. See how many permanents he has access to. It's funny because that's actually one of the things that uh, when I've my limited experience with Murfolk, because I have played in a couple tournaments, that was one of the frustrating things is that you're a mono blue deck, but you have eight colorless lands, and so there are situations like this that do arise. Uh, let alone the draws where you just have like one blue, one island, and then you draw a bunch of mutable and wastelands. And I think that might actually be the problem that that, uh, that Robert runs into here. So he's going to play a wasteland. So that's permit number six. This is permit number seven. So he does get to have something left over. And now he's going to activate Mutavault, and he's going to be able to crash in for six. This is seven, I believe. Is that seven? The master yep, turns okay, on. double pump, double pump. Gotcha. So now, the, in theory, the master loves left over gives Robert a two-turn clock. Yep. What's Brad draw? Gataxian probe. And the rest of the Brad's hand besides the Emrakul doesn't do very much. Mm -hmm. It's just a force of will misdirection that don't really mean anything anymore. So he's going to see a true nemesis and a master of the pearl trident cards that Brad really doesn't care about right. for the most part. You know, those aren't counter spells, so those don't matter. Oh boy! All right, there's a crystal Brad. So. Yeah. So he starts with Emrakul, I would think. Yep. Yep. Trigger Annihilator. What a huge draw there from Nelson, drawing the the next creature. So Emrakul sacrificed six permanents. I like to believe that he sacrifices all the lands and just leaves the master around. Right. This now, was his plan all along. Yes. Now Brad can be pretty confident that you know. He's not going to die next turn, and then the Gristle Brand will sweep things up. Yep. <laughs> I 
Robert already shortcutting through his turn, just attacking with his master, knocking Brad to two. <laughs> yeah, and, and says, I hope you don't have a thing, but Brad shows my gristle brand, and that is going to do it. So Brad Nelson <laughs> with a pretty pretty good smile on his face there. Feels yeah. like he may have stolen one. Oh, I mean, that you know, the, the games against Merfolk when you're playing combo decks are always harrowing because you're, you're under the gun pretty fast mm -hmm. in most games. And then you have to slog through dazes and pierces and force of wills. Definitely not a matchup that the average combo player would want to play against. Uh, Robert Straw, there was a little slow out of the gate. Wasn't really pressuring him very much. But if Robert, even for example, just has a Lord on turn two instead of nothing, uh, I, I think that game is very different. And he's got even more to slog through after sideboard, does Nelson, because you take a look at Marquez's uh, 15 here. He's got three copies of Flusterstorm, two GTAs, uh, Graph Trigger's Cage, three Swan Song, three Submerged, three Relics. So. You know, it's interesting because we talk about Trinity Nemesis a lot, and it doesn't seem like it's, you know, it's obviously fine in this deck because it's a Merfolk and gets bigger, and it's Trinity Nemesis, so, you know, it's going to be a good card, um, but we don't think it's the best Trinity Nemesis deck, but I actually think this is a fantastic Swan Song deck. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What's really nice against this is, you, you know, Swan Song is often at its best against blue decks, and since your lords give everything Island Walk, mm -hmm. you don't care about the 2-2 token that yeah. gets made. Not at all. And a lot of the times, as we saw in that game, you know, you want to be able to activate Mute Vault and get in for damage, uh, you know, play a guy and leave mana up for a Pierce or a Daze or anything. And, you know, the thing with Pierce and Daze, or of course, that if they have more mana, they're perfectly fine. But Swan Song is, a, is for all intents and purposes, a hard counter in this deck. Yes. Uh, that really has no drawback, and it's arguably the best counter spell against Sneak and Show. And he's going to have access to four of those after sideboard. So things get very difficult for Nelson after board. Yeah, I think Swan Song is, is, is kind of a card that's still a little un, underexplored in Legacy right now. Yeah. There's a lot of decks that don't care about giving your opponent a 2-2 two -two for a variety of reasons. And Swan Song is so efficient otherwise. And uh, the, other, the other area, too, before we look at Nelson's sideboard is for our vintage players out there, uh, uh, hopefully some of you guys are watching, I've always kind of wondered what, what kind of effects Swan Song has had in vintage so far. You know, we look at the Eternal Championships, and I don't think there was a ton of it there, but it's how much be, play does it see there? It's got to be busted in Oath of Druids, right? Yeah. It's got to be insane in Oath of Druids. Yeah, I, 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 I imagine that card has to be seeing play in vintage. Because you give them a creature, and then they lose the game. Yeah. You have the Druids. <laughs> I'd like to, to believe it's great. I had to assume that's a thing. No. I don't know very much about Vintage. No, I had nor to do I. I had to assume that Oath of Druids and Swan Song is a thing. No. Brad's sideboard is six Haymakers in this matchup. Three copies of Pyroclasm and... Oh, sorry, only five, rather. Three copies of Pyroclasm and two copies of Red Elemental Blast. He has his own Swan Songs, Echoing Truths, Through the Breaches, and Ley Lines of Sanctity. I don't think he's going to want to touch. These combo decks can't afford to sideboard out too many cards uh, as they still need to keep their combo pieces and cantrips and, you know, whatever counter spells they want to keep in. But Pyroclasm and Red Elemental Blast uh, seem especially well-suited for these games. You see both players are finishing shuffling up. Brad is, Brad is good to go. The happy giant, arms crossed, ready to rock and roll. Yeah. Robert Marquez, down a game, but I think that thing, I mean, I really think that things get significantly better for him after board. I yes. really do. Um, you know, like this is a matchup where it's very easy to board out Trinity Nemesis. You've got significant pressure uh, with your, you know, your lords, and that's just what Merfolk does. You've got Curse Catcher to make things a little more difficult. He's got Forceful, he's got Daze, he's got Standstill, and he's got Swan Songs. And, you know, he might want to sideboard into some other cards potentially, maybe Flusterstorm. I don't think Flusterstorm is great in this matchup, whatever. But, I mean, he has a very, like, streamlined deck after sideboard yes. of what he's trying to do. And it, I would. I think it's going to be hard for Brad to win these sideboarding games. But again, Sneak and Show is this deck that can just go, eh, okay, well, you're dead on turn one. Well, also, you know, all of the disruption for that to be powerful is predicated on Robert having a clock, and the Red Elemental Blast and Pyroclasms are very good at breaking that up. Mm -hmm. Left to his own devices, you know, Brad's going to be able to power through uh, cards like Pulsar Sword and Swan Song. Uh, without any pressure, it, it just doesn't matter very much. So, and, and this is saying this is the important part. Okay, well, Silver Girl adopt this. It's still pressure. There's a Lord, so yeah, he's uh, he's also a pretty good start, is Marquez. See Red Elemental Blast in Brad's hand right now. Take a draw step here. Another Fluster Storm drawn for Robert. So, you got quite a lot of counter spells. You know, Fluster Storm is obviously great against a, a large portion of Brad's deck. As here's a Ponder, um, not great against the Sneak Attack part, but you know, then Brad has to kind of choose. He has to try to figure out what he has in his hand. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what counter spot I have to play around. Because then that's and that's one of the things I like about this deck too. Um, but Blue Decks in general legacy is that is it Pierce? Is it Daze? Is it Force? <laughs> is it Swan Song as another one of the equation now? And is it Flusterstorm? So that's five things you have to think about. Yeah, there's a lot to play around for sure. Two and three. 
you can see right now Marquez's hand, he has a he has some relevant cards hiding out over there. He's got plenty of counter magic, and that Lord makes it so that the clock is uh, the clock is good enough so that he doesn't uh, really have to... I mean, next turn, assuming he just plays the Master of the Pearl Trident um, and then, like, an island up, pretty much good to go. Yep, he's got a, a, a pretty reasonable clock. And, you know, you need to get on the ground first, then start holding up your counter spell mana. If Robert made a, a, a stumble or a mistake in the first game, it was not getting enough pressure on the board before holding up Swan Song. First things first, get some action going. Brad, Brad still mulling over this ponder. This is why I don't play these kind of cards. I guess I did with the reanimator, but I took a long time resolving <laughs> them. That's for sure, he's gonna shuffle away. I feel bad for anyone who had to play against me in DC when I was resolving a brainstorm. I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Ponder. Ponder's even more complicated to resolve because there's the mystery box. Yeah, yeah. It could be anything. You could, or you can take the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Show and Tell was just drawn there for Brad. Got a gristle brand in hand. He's so going to pass the turn back. So Mark is going to take a draw step. He draws a wasteland. Not a bad draw, actually. Because that misty rainforest, if it wants a red source, is going to have to be Volcanic Island. And he wants it so that he can play Lord and have a blue mana available for Flusterstorm or Swan Song. Mm -hmm. That's so important for him. So having the third island in his hand is a really big deal. He also has a force, too. So man, his hand is loaded. And this is a, a pretty rare draw for Robert. Only 10 islands in his deck. Mm -hmm. Typically, Murphog plays 12. He's got two of them for two copies of Cavern of Souls. I think... I think it's interesting, too, because, like, when you're... It's easy for us here in the booth and for you guys at home to be like, yeah, you just cast the Lord, and then you get in for two, and you hold up your counter spell. But when you're playing a sneak and show, the fact that, you know, you can just die. Or, you know, the big threat comes into play, and once the big threat's in play against Merfolk, it, can't, it doesn't get off the board. Mm -hmm. you know, it's horrifying to have to play against this Pyroclasm to draw here for Nelson, which is a very, very good one right now. Part of the problem, though, is that Brad only has access to red mana if he's willing he only can get one red mana it's only if he is willing to sack his misty rainforest which exposes him to wasteland mm -hmm. and he can't play the pyroblast with uh, red elemental blast backup yep so uh, robert is going to be able to probably easily fend this off with one of his fluster storms yep. the good thing here if, uh, for brad however is that the power is going to get countered but that means there's going to be one less counter spell that uh that robert has so you know if you're looking for positives that's oh one sure of them. yeah yeah it's just it's really rough because you know, Robert's like has so much one mana permission that uh, it's not too taxing for him to leave up mana over following turns. Mm -hmm. So he's going to say Fluster Storm. Both copies are going to target Pyroclasm, and the Storm count is two. So Fluster Storm takes care of the Pyroclasm, and Nelson has to just pass the turn back. Now if Robert has Wasteland. Yeah, which we know he has in the grip. Yeah. He slides that right forward, so he says, yeah, get that thing out of here. So he's going to attack for five, puts Brad down to 11. Nelson going to cast a Brainstorm. And I like this play, too, by, by Marquez of just not playing anything. Because he, he drew another Lord for the turn. But now he just has, like, the full wall up. Of, yep. This is almost impenetrable. Of just, I have a, an actual wall of counter spells, and I have you basically dead in two turns. Because the next attack will put him down to six. And then he plays a Lord pre-combat and attacks for lethal. So there's attacks in Probia. <laughs> not going to um, like this. Yeah. Go ahead and write these down. <laughs> Force of Will, Flusterstorm, Swan Song, and a Master of the Pearl Trident. It's gonna be tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Packs it in immediately. Good, good enough. Yeah. yeah. Now, one thing there for Brad is that he gets a lot of information yeah. uh, about the things he needs to worry about if he's gonna try to guess, play the guessing game of what counter spell do you have. <laughs> the bad thing is, is that uh, you got a lot to guess from now. Yeah. Because now you have to worry about Swan Song. You saw, you saw Swan Song, you saw Flusterstorm, you know they have days, you know they have Force of Will, so. His draw in this third game, I think Patrick is going to have to be one of those, you know, pedal to the metal, well, uh, play a sneak attack or show and sell on, on turn two or something. Or he needs to have um, an early pyroclasm. He needs to be able to blunt Robert's pressure to be able to assemble a hand that he can go off through all this stuff. Yeah. But yeah, if Robert's able to do, you know, play a couple creatures and then leave all of his mana up, Brad's going to be in a world of hurt. And if, uh, of course, Patrick, I know you are very interested to know how the Browns did. And uh, they find a way like they always do. Uh, oh, 26-14 with two minutes left. 
Believe land, baby. Ship the loss. Ship oh, the loss. Believe land. If we could fire everyone from the team, I would. That'd be great. <laughs> I actually think after this loss, we should just be contracted. They already took away our football team once. We're used to it. Just take it away again. Yeah, just, there's no big deal. Josh Gordon goes somewhere, and Joe Thomas goes somewhere, and Joe Hayden goes somewhere, yep. and no one else matters. That's fine. So whatever. You know, it's really bad when you talk a lot of trash when there's two minutes left in the game, up 12, and then lose, yeah. which I just did. Oh, God. At least my breakfast was good. You can't delete that tweet. Oh, I can't. No, I have to own it. Yeah, you gotta, have to you own, gotta it. own that. I even made the I even made the worst decision. I don't know uh, how many people are familiar with uh, Zach Eflin, but I posted trash talk on his wall. The most Floridian Floridian of all time. And now I my my phone won't stop vibrating, uh, yeah. so I'm actually going to have to just turn it off because I know he is <laughs> he is lighting me up real good. I'm sure Paul Reitzel's really enjoying himself right mm -hmm. now. Yep, foot in mouth, as it were, foot in mouth. I still think game three here is even though Brad is on the play still really hard to win. Oh, yeah. It's, it, he's definitely behind in the matchup, for sure. Robert came prepared for this. Um, I would argue he's a favorite game one. I think Brad's a favorite game one. Yeah. And yeah. then game two and game three. Ugh. Same deal, we, you know, the feature match we had last last round with Ben Sack and Tom Martell. I think just 60 cards versus 60 cards. The Storm Deck's favorite in that first game, but the post-board games are just, they get so much more difficult for these combo decks. See Brad drawing up seven here. A red blast. A lot of mana. Here's Brad is. I think he's keeping. Uh, does he have a one lander on Marquez's side? Does he have Marquez like an island four standstill? Marquez looks like he has a really, two. really powerful. One lander. I think he's got two in the grip. He's got two? Yeah, he's got two. He just pulled okay. two forward. So he's okay. I think maybe the problem here in his hand is that he might have a silver gold up and no Merfolk. Sure. I think that's the thing that's in question. I'm also going to start off with a uh, Sacred Foundry, or excuse me, a Sacred Foundry, a Scalding Tarn, and get an island. A little manipulation. Get tax improved. So we can find out what he's trying to keep. Yep, and that's what we thought. So, Silver Yellow Adept, Swan Song, Day Standstill Force of Will, Double Island. So, no Merfolk for a Silver Yellow Adept, but he does have a Swan Song. He has a Day, he has a Standstill, and he has a Force of Will. So, a really, really good hand. And two draw steps to find a Merfolk to make this hand excellent. Yes. Additionally, his Standstill can go online if he draws a Mutavolt. So, yes. he can play that game. And I actually think a lot of the time it doesn't favor. The Merfolk player to do that, like if they have a vial, then it works out. Uh, it works out perfect, of course. But I think with how his deck is, uh, the composition of his deck after sideboard, he can afford to just go. You know, if he draws Mutavolt, to just slam standstill and just just do that forever because he has so many one mana counter spells. Mm -hmm. So Marquez just plays an island past the turn back. No ether vials in any of these games for him, as he drew, I believe, a daze for the turn. I believe. And again, I really feel like this is one of those games where Brad just has to have a super early show and tell or sneak attack. Well, it's hard to execute now that he knows the contents of Robert's hand. Yep. Even against a very early sneak attack or show and tell, Robert has a, a fair amount of protection. And you can see Nelson's hand right now. He has the ability. Is he going to play good action? He has the ability to play a turn two show and tell or sneak attack. Excuse me. And he drew a silver gold, so he did draw the Murphle. But he has the ability to play a turn two one because he has a Lotus Spell on Ancient Tomb. But it's just going to get countered. Yep. And Brad with no force of will of his own. Yeah. It's interesting because when people were preparing for Grand Prix DC, they were trying to figure out the best ways to go about beating this deck. You know, people went towards a lot of Caracas's, you know, death and taxes. Um, if they put a show and tell in the play, you know, I just, uh, you know, I put something in that kind of trumps them. Um, all of those different types of strategies. And it, it, to me, it, from just from watching these games play out, a heavy counterspell strategy, actually, it seems like it's pretty good because, again, these one-mana counterspells are, are great. As Here's a Curse Catcher allowing Marquez to keep up Swan Song for land days. Yeah, I'm not sure if I uh, like the Curse Catcher here play here as um, if he had a third land in his hand where he could play Silver Gill Adept and leave open mana next turn, mm -hmm. that would be fine. But uh, I, I understand, you know, we get this bias because we get to see the hands. And if you're in Roberts, you can still be concerned that you could just die on the spot. But uh, it, remember going back to the first game, 
the, the trap that Robert got into was not putting enough pressure on the board before, before trying to hold up a, a wall of disruption. And sometimes you have to be willing to lose to the, you know, the best possible hands that Brad can have here um, to make yourself more likely to win uh, against the more likely range of hands that he has. All right, so Brad is going to search out a basic mount. So he's wasteland proof thus far. Small clock here by Marquez. He can build towards a little bit more. Yeah, and so he's going to play this and this. And yeah, I, I, I mean, I see exactly what Brad's doing here. He's going to take two. Is he's just basically saying, look, I just got to, I got to jam this stuff into your counter spells to be able to get through it. There's no other way for me not to get through it. Because he doesn't have a card, he doesn't have a card like Silence or Orm's Chant or anything like that to say, hey, you have to counter this. He just has to jam his threats, which are Sneak Attack and Show and Tell. And Swan Song's going to take care of this one and, until he can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. so for Brad, he's going to get a, uh, he's going to get a, a little Swanee, a bird. I was actually wondering if he would have the bird token. Let's see Aether, a lot of Swan Songs. Aether Vile the draw for Robert. He thinks it's safe now to cast the uh, Silver Eel Death. With the, he's going to reveal Silver Eel Death, and what he can do here is if, if he draws an island, it's not so bad. But he can't attack, which is a little bit awkward. And now also, we could, uh, I guess it, since the Swan's in play, he can still play Standstill now and be okay. Yes. Right? Because he just attacks the Silver Gold up a bunch until the Swan trades and the Curse Catcher. And Brad's already low because of the Cataxian probes and the fetch lands and Ancient Tombs and such. Brad gonna play this. He's gonna play that. This is oh wow. Did he okay, so he just has another sneak attack in his hand. His hand right now is sneak attack, pyroclasm, and ember pool. Yeah, so he's just trying to slog through all the counter spells that Robert has right now. Gotta counter it. I think he's deciding what blue card he wants to remove. I think Daze is the most appealing one to remove now. Uh, Especially because he has two. Well, the Maybe there's an argument that the second days actually improves the first one to some extent because you might be able to fight over something relevant. Okay. Well, he removes Silvio up, does Marquez, so Force of Will takes care of the second sneak attack. Marquez going to untap. Draw, Island. And I think, I think we serve with the... Uh, uh, I don't like playing the Vile here. I like... I like playing, I think, just standstill. Me too. I think standstill is more than enough right now. And I certainly don't like tapping out to play standstill. Right, because if, if Brad breaks it with a, a thing uh, to go off with, that one mana allows him to draw Swan Song or Fluster Storm or... Draw, Misty. And the other thing, too, is Brad is... I, uh, it is my belief now that Brad is already committed to the plan of just continuously casting show or show it out or sneak attack effects. So the, him playing the... The standstill doesn't matter. The fact that he can't play a one mana counter spell is what actually matters. Yeah. And you see, he draws days, days. He drew a swan, swan song. song. Yep. Th see, the vial doesn't really have an impact on the game, and so really, it's just the way that I think Marquez needed to look at it when he drew it. It's just okay. This is just a dead card. It doesn't, right. It doesn't actually do anything. And the fact that I can draw into so many one mana spells is what's important to me. And also, now Brad can pay for both Dazes and, and Emrakul. So now he has six permanents in play. Robert says this Emrakul six. Ironically enough, uh, Robert will be done in by the Swan token. Before. Yeah, <laughs> the Swan token that uh, normally doesn't have much of an impact in this matchup. And you see he's... Saying, okay, that resolves because he can't double days. And Brad says, activate this, put number four into play, attack you, trigger Annihilator, make you sacrifice your entire board. You take 17, you go down to two. Brad will shuffle everything in. And as you mentioned, the we got swan a, will be what, what gets it done. We got a little birdie left over. Yeah. And there it is, yep. That is it. So Brad Nelson is going to defeat Robert Marquez two games to one. Sneak and Show defeats Merfolk. And Nelson... Moves on to three and one. His top eight dreams are still alive. Yep. Really a uh, hard fought win there for Brad. Uh, definitely identified, you know, the, the way they need to play the game. It's, it's often frustrating uh, to try to just be brute force in your 
sneak attacks and show and tells through those counter spells. But the way that Brad's head was set up, he didn't have a lot. He didn't have brainstorms and ponders to try to set up a better hand. Mm -hmm. He just had what he had, and uh, Robert had a defenses there. Yep. 